Getting a child with school refusal to go back to school is hard, really hard. In this video, I'm going to describe a plan that can help kids back in the classroom, even after long periods of absence, or what I refer to as entrenched school refusal. But be warned, implementing all the steps of this plan is also hard. It would be great to have an easy plan for getting kids back to school. I don't think an easy plan exists. School refusal? especially entrenched school refusal, is one of the most obstinate, intractable, and difficult to change situations that parents are likely to encounter in their kids. And it just takes a lot of energy to make any real difference. But making a difference is possible. And though this plan may not work for every child and family, it has worked for many. And I hope that if you're coping with a child with school refusal, it will be helpful for you as well. Before I describe the steps of the plan, let's do away with a common myth or misconception about absenteeism and school refusal. The myth is that most children who refuse to attend school are simply being willfully defiant and non-compliant, that they're just happy or not attending, or that they're lazy or bad. Research shows that although some children may be truant from school for reasons that are mostly about defiance and rule breaking, that's actually not the story for most children with school refusal. In most cases, the problem has a lot more to do with a child being anxious, depressed, or otherwise struggling with attendance. And that being out of school, although it may feel easier and preferable, is not something that actually makes them happy. A child is a lot more likely to refuse to attend school because something either scares them or makes them really unhappy than because they just can't be bothered doing what's expected of them. That's why when a child is refusing to attend school, the first thing to do is to try to understand what is driving their refusal to go. Is there something happening at school that troubles them? For a child with almost any kind of anxiety problem, school can be a huge challenge. For the child with social anxiety, for example, school is a social jungle full of constant judgment and evaluation and daunting interactions with peers and teachers. For a child with separation anxiety, school is the longest separation in the day. And the fears of not being reunited with parents at the end of the day can make the entire school day an ordeal. And the same goes for the other anxiety problems, generalized anxiety, agoraphobia, obsessive compulsive disorder. They can all be major obstacles to attending school. Even for a child who doesn't struggle with an anxiety disorder, attendance can be really hard. I mean, let's face it. Although everyone has to go to school, school isn't really for everyone. Think about the things that can make school a great experience for kids. If they're really great at academics, like reading, writing, and math, then the school day can be full of rewarding experiences, like being praised and getting good grades. Or if they're really good at making friends and having social interactions, then school can be full of fun times with peers, and the child can enjoy being popular or well-liked. Being great at sports is another thing that can make school enjoyable, as a kid wins the admiration of others and is sought after in athletic games and competitions. But what about the child who isn't particularly strong at academics, or even really struggles with them? What about the child who's not that good at getting along with other kids, and doesn't know the right thing to say in every situation? We all recognize that different adults have to have different jobs, because they're different. But we also expect children to basically all have the same job, which we call going to school. And for some children, having to go to school every day it can just feel a lot like being trapped into a job that you're not really good at, your boss is not allowed to fire you, and you're not allowed to quit. Small wonder that some children look for a way out. Getting kids back to school is important, and it's critical to helping kids advance to the point where they will have more options and more choices about how to spend their time. And this video is all about how to get a school-refusing child back in the classroom. But it also makes sense to acknowledge that school really is hard for a lot of kids and to spend some time and effort trying to figure out what is keeping a particular child from going. This can help to better address the problem 
and to be more empathetic to the child, rather than only getting upset with them for staying home. Now, the steps on the plan that I'm about to lay out are all steps that are implemented by parents, with some help from other people. And they don't require that the child be in treatment, or even agreeing to the parent's plan. If your child is willing to be in therapy, then help them, get them that support. But a lot of children who refuse school are equally likely to be refusing therapy as well. So it's important that parents be able to make a plan to address the problem, even if the child is not particularly collaborative or willing to engage. There are six points to the plan for getting your kid back to school, and it's important to implement all of them to give the plan the best chance of working. It's actually not really likely that any of these steps on their own would make a significant change. So if you're a parent trying to overcome this problem in your own child, give yourself the best chance of success by doing the whole plan, and not just picking the parts that you like the best or that seem easiest to put into action. Now the first part of the plan, even before getting into points one through six, is to determine the expectation level. The expectation level is the step toward resuming school attendance that we expect from this child for this week. For some children who might spend every day sleeping until the afternoon and never getting dressed in outside clothes, the expectation level may be that the child is out of bed before eight o'clock in the morning and dressed to leave the house. For another child who does get up and get dressed but won't go anywhere near the school, the expectation level might be that they drive with the parent to the school building and sit in the parking lot for 20 minutes each morning without actually entering the building. For another child, it might be entering the school building but not actually attending class yet. And for another child, it might actually be full attendance the entire school day. The expectation level should always reflect a meaningful step forward on the path to attendance, but it shouldn't be too big of a leap from the child's current level of functioning. Once you've figured out the expectation level for your child, you're ready to start implementing the steps of the actual plan. Point one. Point one is stop nagging about going to school. This might be the easiest part, or you might actually find that it's really difficult for you. But the plan is to not talk to your child about how you want them to go to school more than once a day at most. Look, if you are repeatedly nagging your child about going to school and they continue not to go, then all you're really doing is telling your child that you're frustrated, helpless, unhappy, and that you have nothing effective to do about it. That's not gonna help, so stop. That is point one. Don't nag your child about school attendance and don't talk to them about it more than once a day. Point two. Point two is during school hours, remove access to the things your child would not have access to if they did go to school. Think about the things your child does at home during school hours and remove those things that help them pass the time but that they wouldn't be able to do if they were in school. That includes games they might be playing, electronics they use, books, magazines, or other things that they read, and really anything else that you identify. Think about what they eat as well, and try to make the food available to them as similar as possible to what they would have if they were in school. Don't leave your credit card for them to order fast food while you're out of the house. Try to pack a school lunch instead. Even your attention can be very important in this context. Don't spend the school hours having conversations with your child or playing games with them. Even really good and important conversations are not actually helpful here. They wouldn't be able to be doing that if they were in school, so not at home either. That is point two. During school hours, remove the things that your child wouldn't have access to if they were in school. By the way, if you're thinking that this will make your child feel really bored during the day, you're probably not wrong. But boredom is more likely to be your ally in this difficult process than your enemy. Point three. Point three relates to the expectation level that we set earlier. 
Let your child know in clear language what your expectation level is for the current week. You can even put it in writing to make sure that you're being totally clear and also to help you stay out of unhelpful arguments. Now, once you've let your child know the expectation, point three says that any day on which your child doesn't meet that expectation level, you remove all electronics for 24 hours. The next day, your child will have another opportunity to meet the expectation level. And if they do, then the access to the electronics will be restored outside of school hours, of course. Don't forget about point two. If they don't meet the expectation level the next day either, then the electronics stay inaccessible until they do meet it. Now, I want to be really, really clear that point three is really talking about access to all electronics, not just taking away the child's phone, but allowing them to still use a laptop or an iPad or an Xbox or a television, etc. Basically, the child shouldn't be seeing any screens turned on. That also means the family TV. So no watching television together. The only exception to this rule would be for a child to do schoolwork on a computer and only with a parent supervising that that's really the only thing they're doing on the computer. Implementing point three is hard and you may need to do some planning to figure out the best way to remove and restore access to all these devices on a day by day basis. But it is possible and it's important. Point four. Point four requires you to ask for some help from the school staff. Ask them to continually reach out to your child and communicate with them as much as possible. Ask them to express to your child that they want to see them back in school and are waiting for them. And ask them to send the child schoolwork, information, assignments, and anything else that the child is missing by not being in school. Even if you're sure that your child won't do any of the work and maybe won't even take the phone calls, still ask them to reach out as frequently as possible. It still helps to maintain your child's identity as a student and to show them that even if they're able to avoid going to school in the morning, it doesn't mean that school is just gone from their day for the rest of the day. Point five. Point five also requires you to ask for help, but this time from family and friends. Make a list of as many people in your family and social circle as you can and ask them to reach out to your child and to deliver a simple message. The message should say something like, I think you're a wonderful kid and I know from your parents that you've been having a really difficult time attending school. I know that can be really hard. I also want you to know that attending school is absolutely critical and I support your parents in doing everything they can to get you back. Let me know if I can help you at all and I hope that things get much better soon. Now, even though I said that you shouldn't be nagging your child about going to school, you should be asking your list of people to be reaching out to your child frequently so that they're getting the message from at least some of the people on your list every day. They won't seem helpless because there was never an expectation that these people would make your child attend school and them stepping in to deliver this message shows your child that this is not a regular problem. Your kid doesn't get lots of people stepping in with messages for other things that they do that you don't like and they'll see that this is different. Being out of school is a crisis and having the world step in and address it helps to make it feel like one. Point six. Point six on our plan only kicks in when your expectation level is at a point where it includes your child actually going to the school in the morning. Even if they don't have to go into class or they don't have to stay the entire day, point six will apply once they have to go into school at all. Point six is also usually the hardest one to implement because it requires both asking for help and a lot of work on your part. But don't skip it. Point six says that each morning when your child is supposed to be going to school, you will have one or two of their friends in your house in the morning to go to school with them. It's easy to see why this would take a lot of work. 
you'll have to discuss with this with the parents of your child's classmates and for them to agree to it. You may need to drive to their house in the morning so that you can bring their child to your house. And of course, you'll have to make sure that their child will get to school even if yours doesn't. It's hard, but it can be done and it can be extremely impactful. Of course, you won't be able to keep up 0.6 forever, but it can be done for a while. And it's definitely one of the most effective points on the whole plan. So that is the six point plan for overcoming entrenched school refusal. I know it's really challenging, but this is a challenging problem and there really aren't any easy solutions to it. So if your child is chronically absent from school, you can work on this plan and you can leave a comment if it worked for you. For more information about SPACE, Supportive Parenting for Anxious Childhood Emotions, a parent-based treatment for childhood anxiety and obsessive compulsive disorder, visit the website spacetreatment.net and stay tuned for other videos about parenting anxious children and adolescents. Thank you and have a nice day.